The AWARE Project's aim is to balance the public conversation about psychedelics, spread accurate information, and give a new face to psychedelia. We feel that this change will occur through connection and relationship, one individual at a time. We are calling on everyone whose lives have been improved through the mindful use of psychedelics to educate themselves and become ambassadors for the psychedelic experience. Show those around you that people who use psychedelics mindfully cross all social, racial, economic, and political boundaries. I'm really excited for Greg to come and share. This is kind of an unusual talk for us um, uh, to have to kind of highlight a little bit of citizen science here. And one of the things that uh, Rick Doblin actually was saying that if you find anything new about um, a new treatment or a new way of uh, like psychedelics being used in a particular way, it needs to become public knowledge quickly because you don't want people to get a patent use on it. Um, so. I guess another thing to make for the record, um, a friend of mine has uh, used Iboga um, and the microdosing um, a regimen, he did do a flood dose, but he managed to uh, essentially cure himself of OCD and Tourette's, which I've never heard of anyone doing that before. <laughs> so um, we were trying to get him connected with a researcher to do a case study on him, but it hasn't quite happened yet. So we're just at least trying to get the information out there. So um, any of the things you hear about, you know, people treating themselves with psychedelics in an unusual or something that maybe you haven't heard of, make sure they're getting that information out to the public somehow, maybe on a forum or sending something to maps to, to, you know, just something so that the information is starting to get out there. And there's, uh, we've got plenty of, of fodder for research studies for decades and decades and decades. For <laughs> so um, with that, um, Greg, I'd like you to come on up and, and share um, with us what you've discovered on some of your citizen science. <laughs> I don't know where having company. <laughs> cookies or something. Um, thank you for coming. I want to thank Ashley for providing this platform for community members to share their knowledge and their experiences. Oh yeah, Ashley. <laughs> I might have oversold this piercing the veil between the conscious and subconscious. I'm just going to go with that. <laughs> This is a harm reduction education presentation. I don't condone or advocate the use of any illicit substances or legal activity. The bullet is serious medicine, shouldn't be taken before serious consideration or research into possible health risks and contraindications. Any advice on the use of a bullet is provided for people who've done this research in a limited jurisdiction where it's not illegal to do so. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> This is a partial list of the health risks and contraindications for using a boga or ibogaine. And this is for a full dose, but there's very little research into microdosing and the health effects. People, especially who have heart conditions or any kind of cardiac defects, should be very careful about using a boga or ibogaine, especially if they have a condition that's QT prolonging. And there's a whole long list of other things to consider here. Should also be noted that we're talking about combining cannabis with a boga. Cannabis can lower blood pressure, so that's another complication for anyone who has car cardiac abnormalities or QT prolongation of any kind. I was looking for a philosophical, de philosophical description of what a boga is. I found this from Tricia Eastman. <laughs> boga is the vehicle that allows you to sit with yourself long enough to realize that thing you were afraid of is an illusion. I love that. <laughs> just in case you missed that. <laughs> That's supposed to be in really big letters for me or something happened in the corner. <laughs> yeah. I knew this question was gonna come up. So the reason I'm doing this, the number of people interested in and actually microdosing a boga is, is increasing rapidly. I know this from talking to people. I also monitor online forums where people talk about microdosing even specifically microdosing a boga. Microdosing to me is a sub-therapeutic dose, what's sometimes called a sub-perceptual sub dose. But I see more and more people crossing over in what might be called mesodosing, something between a sub-perceptual dose and a full dose. 
<laughs> in one form, I saw someone say, I'm microdosing 500 milligrams of aboga daily. 500 milligrams of aboga, even a week aboga, is not a microdose. And if you're taking it daily, you're going to have a full dose in your system probably in about four or five days. There is a professional website that has extensive information on hallucinogenics, including aboga, and a section dedicated to microdosing aboga where they say one gram of aboga should be a safe starting point for microdosing. If you've taken a gram of aboga, you should not be operating machinery, driving, and probably not walking on your own. There are a lot of people who are taking larger doses of aboga, sort of chasing the flood dose experience. So I happened on this combination by accident. The day after I did, I was excited to get online and see what kind of protocols were in place and what kind of experiences people were having. I could not find anything on using small amounts of aboga with relatively small amounts of cannabis to get something that was close to a flood dose experience. That's why I'm doing this. I just realized something. I have notes. <laughs> Not a very good memory. Elizabeth Bass' excellent book, Heart Medicine, tells the story of her efforts to get her partner, Chor Bogey, off of heroin. He had relapsed after 13 years. She knew about plant medicine. She researched a boga and became convinced that might, this might be the solution they needed. She could miss him with that. So they went to Costa Rica to an aboga treatment facility run by a West African shaman named Mogenda. This is from page 183. I could hear Chor churning in his bed, breathing heavily and groaning softly, like someone with a high fever. I reminded myself to remain at ease. We were in good hands, I knew. Now I'm going to continue. Go back to the house where you were as a little baby, maybe eight months old. Don't ask how you're going to get there, just go. The vision was more vivid now. I could see my crib like a cage in the stark walls of the humble home. Find yourself there, Mogenda said. Do you see yourself? There I was. Little me holding on to the bars of the crib, a forsaken, helpless, innocent prisoner. The medicine was stronger now. I struggled a bit to respond with words. Yes. I wanted to hold on to my daddy's fingers, but he was nowhere around. Mother had been gone so long, I was worried she ceased to exist. I had no understanding of time. My little heart panicked, and I wondered if I had been left for the vultures. I realized that everything experienced in infancy was infinitely more intense. Events pressed themselves into the tender flesh and budding brains like a brand. What's happening there, Mugenda asked. I'm crying alone in my crib. I feel like I might be there forever. I'm afraid I've been forgotten. I cry a lot because my tummy hurts. My dad doesn't know how to make me feel better. He gets overwhelmed and just leaves me there. My mom is gone. She's worried and wor worried, worried, worried about me at home. She knows my dad can't care for me, but she has to work anyway. She has to pay the bills. Now hold that little girl. Tell her you love her. I cradled my little self in my spirit arms and felt her frantic crying settle into sweet coos. I looked at her and admired her purity and perfection. She was not left in the crib because she was too much. She was left in the crib because her father was not enough, back then at least. He was just fragile. I felt compassion, both for myself and my young, more torn amateur father. I bought the book because I was interested in the book. After I read that last paragraph, I knew I wanted to work with this medicine. When we talk about a boga, we're talking about the root bark of a tabernacle boga plant, specifically the inner root bark. It's a perennial shrub that grows in Western Central Africa, not Cameroon, Republic of Congo, Gabon. It contains at least 12 alkaloids. The active alkaloid is called ibogaine. It's a highly psychoactive tryptamine. This is the difference between iboga and ibogaine. That's a question that comes up a lot. Iboga is the entire plant. Ibogaine is a single alkaloid extracted from that plant. The reason you hear about iboga being used in clinical settings for a couple of reasons. Ibogaine concentration from plant to plant varies, so 100 milligrams of root bark from this plant might be a lot stronger or weaker than 100 milligrams of root bark from that plant. It makes it hard to dose accurately. You also need to take a lot less, so whereas you might take one capsule of ibogaine, you might have to take 10 or 15 capsules of iboga. Iboga was discovered by the Babango or Pygmy people. Legend has it that a Babango man trapped a porcupine and brought it home for dinner. His wife ate the porcupine and went on an intense shamanic journey in which her true spiritual nature was revealed to her. 
She told her husband about it, and he wanted to find out what happened, so he went back to where he laid the trap. They discovered the porcupine had been eating the root of a tree in the forest. He took the root back to his village and gave it to the rest of the tribe. The entire tribe received profound healing and messages about plants from the jungle to use to address different ailments and parasites. They eventually shared their knowledge with other Huiti practitioners. Huiti is a spiritual discipline practiced by over a quarter million people across tribes in Western Africa. It incorporates elements of animism, ancestor worship, and Christianity into the syncretistic belief system. It's not a monolithic belief system. The tenets of Huitiism vary widely, even within a single tribe. Among those that incorporate heavy elements of Christianity, there are a lot of Huiti who believe that Iboga is the original tree of knowledge referenced in Genesis. It's a sacrament to the Huiti people. They use it to communicate with ancestors, and initiation ceremonies, rites of passage, different types of healing, and these small amounts as a stimulant, kind of like how we use coffee. That's right, I'm in this presentation. <laughs> Joel, if I forget I'm in this presentation again, can you remind me? I got you. All right, thank you. Thank you. So after reading Elizabeth Bass's book, reading everything I could online, watching scores of YouTube videos, and talking to friends of mine who've done Iboga, I found a center I wanted to work with. When I contacted them, I had a half-hour phone conversation where we went over my psychiatric and medical history. They sent me a pile of forms to fill out, including a detailed medical history. They had me see a doctor to get an EKG, a liver and kidney panel. I told them I was training for a marathon. I didn't know that my doctor was a marathoner. So he wanted to know about my diet, what race I was in, my exercise regimen. The only thing I know about marathons is that they're 26.2 miles, so I think he was a little confused. I sent the results off and I started making tentative travel plans. During a fall or flood dose for a boga, this, and this is not talking about uh, addiction eruption, this is talking about psychospiritual. It's also called psychospiritual journey, light review, or deep rag. It produces an altered state of consciousness that's then called the dreaming while fully conscious. You can view past experiences, even highly traumatic experiences, but so without experiencing any emotions. Levels of serotonin and dopamine are normalized, and the brain's in a highly neuroplastic state after using a boga. The first phase is called the waking phase, waking dream state. You experience body heaviness and difficulty standing. Aubrey Marcus said it was like laying on a plate of syrup with a 500 pound stack of pancakes on you. <laughs> so if you ever lay on a plate of syrup with a 500 stack, pound stack of pancakes on you, that's what a boga feels like. What does that mean? <laughs> Have you ever laid on a plate of syrup with a 500 pound stack of pancakes on you? I can't explain it to you. Something you have to experience. <laughs> I'll answer it in the Q&A, okay? All right. <laughs> Nausea and purging is not uncommon, especially when moving. So most people tend to be very still during the experience. They're sensitive to light. A lot of people report their third eye opening. So when their eyes are closed, covered, or in a darkened room, they report seeing the accurate details of the room, including people moving around inside. Highly personalized visions come to people. Some are metaphorical, some are very literal actual memories of life events. Some people recall forgotten memories. Visions stop at any time when you open your eyes. Some people think of Iboga as more of an anirogen, something that produces dreams rather than hallucinogen, because you don't hallucinate with your eyes open. You can stop the visions at any time. Second phase is sometimes called the evaluative or introspective phase. Then the visions that you saw are made clear. A lot of people then make connections between the visions and life events that help them determine the root causes of trauma, negative thought patterns, negative and uh, destructive behaviors, even substance addiction. The next phase, when the psychoactive state fades, people report reduced appetite. Some people don't sleep much for days or weeks. There's a strong afterglow and a feeling that anything is possible. This is partly because Ibogaine metabolizes something called noribogaine a natural antidepressant that stays in the liver for as much as six months. The brain is highly neuroplastic, mostly because ibogaine causes a long-term increase in something called glial cell line-derived neurotrophic factor, or GDNF, a growth hormone that promotes neuroplasticity and neurological regeneration. That's worth repeating. Ibogaine causes long-term increases in a growth hormone that promotes neurological regeneration. So, Joel, <laughs> I gave you one job. <laughs> 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 so,
So when the center called back, I was very excited until they told me I wasn't a candidate for a flood dose. I take an anti-seizure medication called Dilantin every day. I haven't had a seizure for over 25 years, probably because I take that medication. But because of the way that Iboga works, it would essentially clean that medication out of my system, at which time I might have a seizure. Understandably, the center didn't want to work with me. Other than that, my heart was strong, the other tests looked good, so I was medically cleared to take Iboga, except for that. So I figured maybe microdosing was a way to work with this medicine. Microdosing of boga sometimes creates an elevated and stabilized mood because of the noribogaine accumulating in your system, increased energy, improved concentration, unless you take too much and it builds up in your system, at which time you'll probably have decreased energy, get brain fog, helps people to more easily identify negative thoughts, behaviors, and patterns, may help people give, give things like smoking, alcohol, or drugs. And you might have trouble sleeping, but if you do, you're gonna have very vivid dreams, most likely. When I microdosed Iboga, I started off with 20 or 40 milligrams, and I worked my way up to 250 milligrams. I did that every other day for four days, and when I got to the eighth day, so figure 1,000 milligrams in my system, I hit a wall. I was extremely tired, my brain was foggy, and I could not concentrate, so I stopped. I backed off for five days. Then I took 300 milligrams. I took it late in the day. I figured I might have trouble sleeping because it is a stimulant, you can feel it. I smoked a little bit of cannabis, I laid down and put on Bwiti music. Bwiti music is to a boga, is Icaro's car to ayahuasca, meaning it was designed and engineered to work with that medicine. It's primarily mouthful, heart percussion, and vocals. It's fast paced. It's not relaxing medicine music, if that's what you're thinking. <laughs> it will make you nervous just listening to it. It's considered a lifeline that reaches from this life to the hereafter. It helps anchor you in this space while you navigate the visionary space of the boca. It's polyrhythmic, meaning it has more than one rhythm, sometimes at binaural beats. It influences emotions and visions during the during the boga ceremonies. I have personally experienced this music controlling the medicine in my body, so I know what they mean. So I took 300 milligrams of root bark, laid down, put on the weekly music, decided to smoke a little, little bit of cannabis, which I hadn't done for weeks, closed my eyes. The first thing I remember thinking was, I don't like this music. It's not very relaxing. It's making me nervous, and I'm going to stop listening to it but it was kind of hypnotic, so I kept listening. And I had the distinct feeling after a while that I was sneaking out the back door. I think this music actually keeps your conscious mind busy so that you can work with your subconscious because I could feel myself here, listening to the music, and over here in kind of a quiet spot thinking. I thought of something someone had said to me a day or two earlier that I thought was critical of me. I saw it sort of graphically, which I don't usually do. That person, what they said, and how I received it. And I thought there must be more to it than that. And it turned on its axis. And I saw that person's history, triggers, opinions of me, attention when they said it, what they had said, the validity or lack thereof, my mood, history, intentions, opinion of that person, receptivity to what they said, and I started analyzing this thing multidimensionally. At one point, I turned it around and I could see it from the other person's point of view, and I thought, yeah, I was being kind of a dick. I had that coming. <laughs> Not long after that, I started thinking about a negative opinion I held of myself. And I wondered, why do I have that opinion? And the medicine just told me. Because this happened when you were very young. I said, that's right, that did happen. Then not long after, these four things happened, and it validated that opinion. I thought, make, that makes sense. And then it said, but these hundreds of things happened after that. But this was so impactful, and you were so invested in it, that you ignored all of these things that invalidated that opinion. <coughs> I didn't see a balance scale, but I could tell that this thing fell on a balance scale, and the invalidation so outweighed the original incident that it shot it up into space, and when that happened, I no longer had that opinion of myself. It was gone. <clears throat> exactly, yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> what the? <laughs> so four different people agreed to let me share their experiences anonymously. Number one. I went in with a specific issue I wanted to focus on, but when I closed my eyes, I kept thinking about a decision I'd made a couple of weeks earlier. I'd been presented with an opportunity to make a career change. 
My new job would be much more closely aligned with my values, but would also pay me much less. It would have required downsizing my residence and making some major lifestyle changes. I decided this wasn't the right time, but I couldn't stop thinking about it now. The Avoca was telling me, without using words or pictures, that my decision was somehow tainted or contaminated. I was trying to figure out what it was telling me when suddenly I had a very vivid recollection of something that happened when I was four or five years old. <clears throat> something I've forgotten about, at least I thought I had. It was Sunday. My mother was getting my little brother and me ready for church as she did every Sunday. That day I decided I wanted to wear my favorite pair of overalls to church. Mom wanted me to wear a, uh, wear a dress, and I was so upset I was crying. I remembered her looking me in the eye and saying, Honey, what will people think if you walk into church wearing overalls? All the other little girls will be wearing pretty dresses and everyone will just be staring at you in your overalls. I've always prided myself on being independent and not worrying about the opinions of others, but now I can feel how deeply this has affected me and how so many decisions that I have made in my life, from relationships to education to the clothes I wore, and yes, even my choice of career, have been made based on whether or not I thought other people would approve. Some of those people weren't even central to my life. It suddenly seemed like an utterly absurd thing to consider. I knew right then that this was something that wasn't going to have a hold on me any longer and I was taking the new job. Incidentally, that same night I resolved the issue I originally went in thinking about. The Avoga just took me on a much needed detour before that. Number two. I found myself in a place where I could see my thought patterns laid out right in front of me and I could basically swipe away ones that didn't serve me, kind of like a touch screen. It also had me confront some issues from my past and go through some of the emotions in order to release them. It was like being in a psychoanalytical playground of sorts. I could just move around in that space and work on different emotional patterns, seeing where they came from, why they were there, and how they no longer served me. Number three. I put on some meditation music and grabbed a notebook. I started meditating. The first thing that came up for me was a feeling of love for my lost pet. I cried for about five minutes. I let myself sink into the feeling of grief and decided to surrender to my body. I let my body take over and it changed my seating position and also my breathing patterns. I had a series of three long exhales where I felt this giant cloud of grief escape through each breath. I felt much better after this. It's a week later and I still feel much lighter in the grief department. Number four, I started thinking about my positive attributes. I felt like I could see the thoughts forming in my mind and floating up in the air, but something strange was happening. Little pieces of paper were attaching to each thought as it rose. I zoomed in and saw that these pieces of paper had qualifiers on them. The thought, I'm a loyal friend, had a note attached that said, so what, so are a lot of people. I'm a good father said, that's your responsibility, of course you are. I realized that this is what I did whenever a compliment was paid to me even for myself, and saw how destructive and unkind this was. I didn't treat other people like this, so why was I doing it to myself? As soon as I thought that, I saw all the pieces of paper detach themselves from the thoughts and fall to the ground. More thoughts came one after another so quickly I didn't even have time to think them. They started stacking up on top of one another and took the shape of a human form, kind of like a space suit. In my mind, I stepped into that suit and fully felt for the first time in a long time that I was truly a good person, no qualifiers. If someone wants to microdose, I would assume they were in a jurisdiction where it was legal and that they had researched all possible health risks. If you smoke cannabis, I recommend abstaining when you start microdosing. You want to be able to feel the effects of the aboga on its own, and that tolerance to cannabis can interfere with the micro flood experience. I recommend starting small, seeing how the medicine affects you. You can try 10 or 15 milligrams of rhubarb. Work your way up slowly, taking time up between microdoses. 15% of ibogaine you consume is active in your system three days after your dose, and it builds up. <clears throat> Pay attention to your mood and energy level. If they drop, there's a chance you have too much medicine in your system. You should back off for a while. Think of some questions you'd like answered. Why do I think this? When did I start doing or thinking this and why? What would it be like if I stopped or started doing this? Then take a break from my microdosing for five days or more. On the day of, have a quiet, darkened, or mostly darkened space ready where you can lie down in solitude. It's easy on this combination of medicines to get caught up in something like watching a movie, listening to medicine, talking to friends, but this is something you should do in the dark and quiet. 
have some music ready to play. You can find Bwiti music, also called Iboga music, on YouTube. I highly recommend using that. You should keep a pen and a paper or something to record thoughts as they come, because as quickly as they come, they'll go away. Have cannabis ready to smoke, water or coconut water. Set an intention for the journey. And have a sitter nearby, please, especially the first time you work with this medicine. Place a small amount of medicine on and under your tongue. Feel it. Feel the spirit of the medicine. It's going to be bitter. It tastes like wood, because it's wood. <laughs> <laughs> and it will numb your mouth for a while. You don't take it for the taste. <laughs> State your intention out loud as you're tasting the medicine. Then take the balance of the medicine. When you feel the effects, probably 20 to 30 minutes later, go to a mirror. Repeat your intention out loud, forcefully. Look yourself in the eye when you do it. You're actually talking to yourself at this point. Make sure you mean it. Give the medicine permission to heal you. I actually say, I give this medicine permission to heal me. Go to your quiet place. Review your questions a few times. Burn them into your brain. Think about them. Get comfortable. Smoke a small amount of cannabis and give the medicines permission to heal you. I give these medicines permission to heal me. Start the music. You can darken the room or color, cover your eyes. Think about your intention, your questions. The medicine might take a detour if it's fine. If it does, that's fine. Write down things as they come to you if they seem important because they will go away very quickly. They might seem really important monumental, there's no way you forget, and five seconds later you're thinking, shit, what was I just thinking? <laughs> so try not to get distracted by visual phenomenon. You might see wormholes, tracers, different things. You can open your eyes and they'll stop. Try to think and go inside. And please be careful when you first stand or walk. Not so much because of the aboga, when you combine it with the cannabis, it can get intense. You can also do things like telling the medicine to do something. Find all the thoughts and emotions in my body that are related to it. Let go of the anxiety I feel around. Show me where a particular physical or emotional pain is located and let that go. We just had a conversation, I think, last week about psychedelics and mirrors. They don't always mix very well. Yeah. But talking to yourself in the mirror on the boga is actually very powerful. You can repeat your intention, talk about something you've learned, ask yourself questions. You might answer yourself. You might be surprised at the answer, believe me. The book is a heart opener, so thinking about the people and relations in your life can be very powerful. It's important not to worry about how the medicine is working. You can get very distracted doing that. Just let it do its work. It knows what it's doing. If the journey feels a little too strong, you can eat. You can slow down the cannabis, and that will bring you back down. The aboga itself isn't that intense when you're talking about something between 150 and 300 milligrams. But smoking cannabis with it makes, it makes it intense. Eat something starchy or sugary, it'll come down pretty quickly. You can always smoke more cannabis and go back in if you want to. When you feel like you've completed your journey, probably somewhere about like two to four hours after it starts, stay in a quiet place. Your brain's in a high state of neuroplasticity. Think about what you've learned and what kind of changes, if any, you want to make in your life. It's a perfect time to do that. Your brain is now waiting for you to demonstrate what the change in your life will look like. Don't just go about your normal routine. Because of this state of neuroplasticity, post-journey integration is critical with the boca. If you go back to your normal routine, your brain is going to think things are, things are normal, the same as they were before. Do something different. Be in nature if you can. Try not to eat junk food or things that clog you up. Meditation and yoga can be very grounding at this time. Massages, other kinds of body work or energy work feel great. You move the energy around in your body. You can read through or listen to your notes and do that as quickly as possible after the journey and try to remember how you felt when you recorded them. That's important. Reading or listening to anything educational or inspirational is especially good at this time. Things seem to sink in. It's a great time to learn something in general. I took a workshop on a type of energy work that I do one time. It's one of the best workshops I ever attended. Be aware that cannabis can reactivate a boga for a period of time, sometimes days or weeks, so plan accordingly. 
Mm. And in the same way that psychedelics seem to make cannabis more psychedelic, aboga seem to make it more aboga-like. It's a much deeper, more reflective experience for me now. And remember, if there's any behavior, habit, or anything at all you want to change in your life, directly after the journey is the time to do that. Your brain is waiting for you to show it what your new life is going to look like. So with that, I'll say thank you and ask if there are any questions. Are you going to ask about the pancakes? No, but oh, okay. that would be a good part too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm not clear about the dosage. I think you said something like 10 to 25 milligrams at some point, and then you said something about 150 to 200. I think when you're microdosing, starting off very slow just to see the effects of the medicine on you is a good idea. I mean, it's not a bad idea to put some on your skin and make sure you're not allergic to it in general. But I would start off with a very small amount to see how it affects you. And you that's not the micro dose. That's, that's not a micro flood dose. dose. The doses for the experiences that I listed were somewhere between 200 and 350 milligrams. But again, that's from a particular batch. 200 and 350 milligrams <coughs> from another plant, that, and they're all root bark, by the way, might be a little bit stronger, a little bit weaker. I think you'll get an idea of how strong it is when you're microdosing after a while. You feel the stimulant effects. As opposed to what is a full dose, a flood dose? Full dose, you're talking in grams. How many grams? Grams and grams. Good God. Ashley, what's a full dose? Uh, it could be like, um, yeah. like 700 to 900. I'd say it's like. You're talking about um, ibogaine. Yeah. So that would translate to what in root bark, because we're talking about root bark. Uh, Grams and grams and so like, like, you know, like nine hundred yeah, like yeah, 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 lots of spoonfuls. <laughs> We're talking about two hundred milligrams, which doesn't fill up a capsule. They're talking about lots of spoonfuls. So there's a big difference. And how much cannabis and what kind? Like is it a high THC, high CBD? Like does it not matter? Most of it are high, is high THC. This is both uh, cannabis and in, uh, excuse me, sativa and indica. That doesn't seem to matter so much. Not so much cannabis, you can adjust and smoke more. Someone asked me about edibles not long ago. I think that's kind of hard to control because of the timing. I would smoke a little bit and see where you're at. You can always smoke a little bit more. I the peak of a, a hit, two huh? hits, four hits. You can smoke a hit, two hits. I've done something like three or four hits. It does increase your tolerance to cannabis, by the way. So you can smoke a lot more, so I'd be careful and start off small. Smoke a little bit, close your eyes, and see where you are. You'll know if you're there, believe me. <laughs> Sorry, what did you say about the THC? You said something about the THC content. Oh, you said THC content. No. Um, Is it better to have like higher THC content or lower THC content? I would say higher THC higher. content. Yeah. Over. I'm sorry. Over CBD. Yeah. How many times have you done this? <laughs> um, north of eight. Any difference between? As you progress through those eight? Yeah, there was actually. Um, where at first, I seemed to be dealing with mental issues and thoughts that were in my brain. At one point, I got to the point where there was sort of a somatic element to it, where I could see. I'll give you. An, no, I'll give you an example. I found a switch one time in my brain. <laughs> I was traveling the landscape of my mind, and I saw a sort of a wall. And I could tell it was a false wall, that there was something behind it. And I knew I built that wall. I tore the wall down because I built it. So I had the right to tear it down, and I found a switch. Underneath that switch were hundreds of other switches. The ones on the bottom had been flipped. And when I got closer, I could see what that switch was for. It was a switch. I had a traumatic childhood. It was a switch that I built when I was 12 years old that told me to view my life and later to view my past like it was a movie, so that I would laugh at the funny parts and be sad at the sad parts, but I didn't have to be in it. I could view it like a movie. And when I looked at that switch, I knew that I had the right to turn that switch. When I turned that switch, I realized I had been living with a sort of delay on my life, so that if things got too hairy, I could pull out any time without getting hurt. When I flipped that switch, the experiences of my life from the time I was 12 years old ran through me one at a time in rapid succession, and I felt the emotions that were connected with every one of them. So without dealing with the issues that were in my life, which I think everyone should do, I highly recommend that people be in therapy as well. This is not therapy to me. 
I found a sort of a semantic or mechanical aspect of how my mind works and figured out how that works and figured out how to reverse that. Well, that's good because a lot of memories reside in the body. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so would you say this is more linear and logical than uh, an ayahuasca? It's not similar to ayahuasca. This. At this level, it's going to show you what's in your mind. There are not a lot of hallucinations, not a lot of metaphor. Ben, are you the one who said that you might ask ayahuasca the meaning of life and it'll show you a goat? <laughs> Someone said that one time and it made sense and it's much more logical. It will show you the thoughts in your mind. Okay, and it kind of uh, synthesizes information. Yeah, exactly. I mean, at higher doses, I know people have very hallucinogenic experiences on Boga and Ibogaine. At this level, it's simply going to show you what's going on in your mind. <laughs> Micro flood dosing? <clears throat> Micro flood dosing, 800 milligrams. But again, I've been medically cleared for this. Um, I wouldn't tell someone to do that much. And I had worked my way up to that. Yes? Um, I'm assuming because of epilepsy? Yes. So have you noticed any difference now that you've uh, uh, taken I go to several times in this format? Do you need less dilant? Are you still doing the same? Have you noticed any difference in your seizure disorder? I'm doing the same because my disorder is one, um, the nature of it is that I'll have a grand mal seizure out of nowhere. nowhere. I'll be talking to you and the next thing I know I'm waking up from a seizure. Okay. I don't have auras and I can't tell a seizure is coming. So. I just maintain the same level of medicine. I don't know if there's any physiological change. Okay. But I space out the aboga journey so there's not too much in my system. And I haven't been microdosing consistently. I've been doing this micro flood dosing. There is a difference. So. Yes, sir. In um, hearing other people recount uh, full flood experiences, because I've heard of people doing aboga for three weeks in traditional uh, practices in, in Africa. Um, what have you understood the difference and what lessons that people that are going to that level of intensity versus uh, what you've uh, been researching or experiencing I with think, uh, microdosing? Yeah, I certainly think it's more powerful under a flood dose. That's my understanding after extensive reading. I haven't experienced that firsthand, so that's something I only go secondhand. I know micro flood dosing. I know what I've read about flood dosing. I think it's more profound under a flood dose. I wish that I could do that. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah, it's hard to answer that because I don't know what it's like in a flip dose. Yes. How, how many days um, are you um, are you talking about for the 10 to 15 milligram? Um, I would say try the 10 to 15 and see how that feels. If you can do it a couple of you know a couple of times, like wait a few days and try that again, or wait a few days and try 25. Up it slowly. You don't have to rush into it. And but, then. Um, I'm sorry. What was the what was the amount that you were suggesting for the or that, that you did for the uh, the the, my, the flood dose or the higher dose? The first time was 300 milligrams. Um, I had gotten to 250, and I knew how that felt in my body. And once again, I've been medically cleared basically to take this, except for taking a med certain medication. Okay. Thank you. Yes. How do you find the the intensity of like the vertigo or the nausea? Just, you know, Not much, actually. When you take the, the aboga itself, I can function at 300 to 400 milligrams. Uh, walking around outside, I'm fine. It's a stimulant effect. Once I smoke the cannabis, I have to get somewhere and sit down, and there are times where I might have to lay down. It's the cannabis that really potentiates it. So that potentiates nausea. Out, they, they potentiate each other. They're, I haven't experienced nausea. No one I, no one I know has experienced nausea or uh, purging at that level. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Uh, I wouldn't say it's not therapeutic. I said it's not therapy. I wouldn't use it to replace therapy. I see. Okay. I, I personally have used uh, personal coaching, like transformational coaching, traditional psychotherapy, and plant medicines in my life. I like all of them. Mm -hmm. So different psychedelics have different risks, and usually um, most of them don't have physical risks, but they have psychological risks. And I know that Iboga has physical risks. Are there any psychological risks with Iboga? 
Not that I know of, but the physical risks are considerable at high levels. I mean, there's depending on who you listen to, there's either one in 400 or one or 300 deaths of people who take aboga. Now, Kenneth Alford did a study that showed that every one of those that he could find data on was due to someone taking a contraindicated medi medication or having a condition that was contraindicated to aboga. But it's serious medicine. So yes. the, the contraindications come from having a similar or um, uh, like the clearances, uh, clearance patterns, they like they they, they have a similar clearance to the liver, and so therefore um, the body doesn't have, you know, they, they interact with each other. All that goes impaired or impaired liver or kidney function should be cared for. Uh, that's all. I know. I know that I took the test and I was cleared, so I wasn't worried about the mechanics or pharmacological. Oh, okay. So it wasn't like the, the taking your seizure medication. No, no, basically because of the way aboga works at high levels, and this is what, how it works for addicts, it will clean the substance out of your system. They told me it would clean the dilantin out of my system. It has to be maintained at a certain level in my body, between 10 and 20%. If it's cleaned out, there's a dangerous seizure, at which time I can't metabolize medicine. They can't control it. So for 24 to 36 hours, I can't control seizures. I didn't have <laughs> You've shared that uh, plant does have neurobiological regeneration properties. Have you personally, or in what ways have you felt those effects with prolonged use of this plant in terms of your mental clarity, um, maybe emotional stability? You know, with me using plant medicines, it's like I gain a little bit, bit of that every time. But I, I use them very intentionally. Um, you know that I focus very heavily on integration, and I think I get something valuable from them every single time I use them. I don't know if that's true physically in my brain, neurologically. That I'm not sure of. Would you say in, um, and again, I'll make a comparison to ayahuasca. <coughs> ayahuasca seems like it's more of a, um, an, an external healer, whereas you can uh, bring your family closer together, or, you know, friends, workplace type of thing, would you say this is more external or more internal? It sounds like it's more internal, but are you finding that there's a lot of external healing too? You know, it's more external in the way that I've been experiencing it and using it. One thing I haven't done, which I'm interested in, is, is using it in a setting where it is more social and not so isolated. I have been around other people and find that it's very bonding and healing and it deepens relationships. Um, so I'm not sure what it would be like in a ceremonial setting or with more than one person involved. Yes. Um, so how would you say that um, having a high tolerance for cannabis interferes? You mentioned that earlier, and what would you recommend for someone who's dependent on cannabis? Um, I think the high tolerance is just because you know, I was talking to someone here earlier who was talking about the effects of cannabis when you don't smoke and how profound they are and how that's sort of dulled when you smoke regularly. Uh, I know that one person who tried this combination was a regular smoker and took a particular dose and smoked some cannabis and not much happened during that experience. Once they abstained from cannabis for a while, they actually sort of overshot it. <laughs> they probably should have smoked a little less cannabis. But I think that just has to do with the nature of cannabis. When you're smoking it all the time, yeah. the effects aren't as profound and pronounced. Yeah, I wonder if Maybe just bringing the dose up with the cannabis would help? It what? It, like bringing the dose up of the cannabis, if that would maybe help? You know, I smoke cannabis almost daily for a long time. Uh -huh. um, and I think it was Graham Hancock who said, he said something like, I had a 25-year cannabis habit, which basically means I was stoned for 25 years. <laughs> so you're operating from a certain level. I think once you're high all the time, it's hard to get high. <laughs> you're yeah, going to yeah. take this substance, and then when you smoke, you're not going anywhere else because you're already there. Right. Um, what if, what if, I'm not sure if already having the cannabis in your system would already potentiate it, but just my experience with one person, I saw when there was cannabis in their system and they smoked regularly, there didn't seem to be much of a reaction to the aboga. Once they cleaned it out of their system, took a little aboga and smoked the other cannabis, they had a profound experience. Yeah. So uh, it's just been my experience. I have no idea how it actually works. Have you encountered anyone um, who is dependent on cannabis? I haven't, no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 how, how long do you recommend to clean out if someone is a chronic user? I 
would say four or five days. Can you handle that? <laughs> yes. Have you encountered anyone that with any neurological, uh, neurologically degenerative disorders or diseases like MS who have microdosed or used this at all? No, and personally, I mean, someone asked me before, are the people who uh, I know who've tried this are people with severe depression, and I don't know anyone, I haven't talked to anyone among my acquaintances who has a severe psychological, uh, psychological or neurological disorder. It's only been people who are, who don't have those disorders, to put it that way. So I haven't, no. I do know that because of the fact that it uh, does promote growth of this hormone that promotes neurological growth, there's research being done in the Parkinson's, in Parkinson's, with the boga being used, or, or Ibogaine used, being used to treat Parkinson's. Yes? Pancakes? <laughs> 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 Actually, I don't know you have to ask Audrey Marcus. Yes? Um, do, you, do you know if uh, Ibogaine is this has ever been used for uh, end of life anxiety? I have no idea. That would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Have you found a difference between um, straight root bark and like total alkaloid extraction experience? Yeah, I haven't, but I prefer, you know, I've worked with total alkaloid. That is an extract of all the alkaloids. Um, the one thing I saw that made me sort of hesitant to work with it is one of the one of the people who practice in Fuji saying that when you extract medicines, you have to be very careful to retain the spirit of the medicine that is done correctly. So not knowing how it was extracted, I sort of avoided it from then on. I didn't notice a difference in the power of the medicine. Just whenever possible, I like to work with the whole medicine. Yes, sir. Have you ever noticed any uh, like auditory phenomena? I've heard of the auditory phenomena being pretty prominent. I haven't at this level, no. Um, there are a lot of the effects of a voter I would gain at full doses that you don't feel at this at this level. Um, and I almost went into some detail about that, but time didn't permit it. And, and also, I'd be speaking uh, about something that I only heard secondhand because I haven't done a flood dose. I know what I've heard. But yeah, I haven't noticed any auditory phenomena. Yes? Um, do you know of any traditional use in the Bwiti culture using cannabis? I don't actually. Okay. It, it, it amazed me when I started looking at this after my first experience that I didn't find people talking about using cannabis with the boga. Huh. But there, I'm not sure there's use in that area. Yeah, I'm sure there is, yeah. Okay. You're talking about 300,000 people that practice the booty, you practice booty, so. Right. Have you done this in nature yet? I have not, no. I've always been in a safe place where I have a pillow to put my head on. Munchies to eat and things to drink. Um, <laughs> to to it. Yes. On that note, uh, you mentioned there are certain foods that can help in you know, just dulling the experience. Um, what kind of foods? I, I think that's after the experience. You know, to me, when you clean your body out and your brain's asking you, "What is my life going to look like?" It doesn't make much sense to eat Cheetos. <laughs> you're going to be making a change in your life. You can eat Cheetos later if you want to, but I think if you're showing your brain this is what our new life looks like, it helps to have a nice, healthy, clean diet and not clog your body up and show your brain that we're going to clog our arteries and our intestines. That's what our new life looks like. I heard bananas. Eating something with fats may kick the cannabis back up again. Yeah, true, yeah. I mean, starchy or sugar brings it down pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. How long does the whole thing take? Uh, between two and four hours. You know, for me, I don't smoke cannabis much, so it affects me pretty heavily. So the rest of the time, I can feel the cannabis and I want to sleep and things like that. But um, Iboga and Ibogaine peak after about two hours, I believe. And somewhere after that, in the next hour or two, it's going to wind down pretty quickly. The first two hours seem to be the most powerful. Um, like Ashley mentioned about OCD and Tourette's, have you had any experience with anyone with autoimmune issues like psoriasis or things like that? No. I, I haven't had experience with anyone who's got any sort of neurological or physical ailment that they're dealing with.
Yes. Did you have a conversation uh, regarding the, your epilepsy? In that uh, state? Have a conversation? With the, the plant medicine. I haven't, no. And I didn't have one in the mirror with myself. That would be interesting. Yeah. yeah. That was the question. Yeah. I got here a little late. I don't know if I covered it. Ibogaine or iboga, is that an extract? Ibogaine is an extract. The boga is, you're generally root talking bark. about the root bark of the yeah. tabernacle, the boga plant. Yeah. Ibogaine is the active <coughs> alkaloid that's been extracted from that root bark. Extracted, okay. Yeah. So it's a single alkaloid. There are more than 12 alkaloids, or at least 12 alkaloids in a boga. Ibogaine is the active alkaloid that's been extracted from the plant. Splendor in the forest in the way that she is made. 
and closing of, of ceremonies that I sit in.